Hey everyone, how are you doing? I hope everything is okay. Uh, and there's a new week coming up, so wish everyone the very best for the week ahead. I hope you all enjoy the week and uh, you can have a lot of fun building programs. So I wanted to actually jump in on a Sunday night and kind of like uh, talk about some of the most interest, one of the most interesting things I've seen t over this weekend. So one of the things that I've been always trying to um, uh, research about is the br coming together of the cloud and the desktop. So if you have a desktop which is built uh, on some of the same technologies that power the cloud infrastructure, it's very much possible that you can share and uh, take a lot of the resources that enable um, high-speed collaboration on the cloud uh, to this to every aspect of desktop computing so uh, for anyone familiar in the cloud uh, workspaces docker is something that all of you would be familiar of you would have used it at some point uh, docker is a tool that essentially helps you containerize your workspace so if you've been working through any of the <laughs> software engineering companies nowadays you would have heard of docker and the fact is that Docker itself maintains as a product the Docker engine, which is a product that runs on your desktop. And it's 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 it used to be uh, at least until a few uh, and at least until some time ago, and even predominantly now, the primary way in which developers interface with Docker. So that's the Docker desktop that they call it here now. So they've made a major change to the Docker desktop. And today when I uh, installed it on my Windows uh, PC, I was able to actually uh, uh, set up a lot of things which I could not set up earlier and they were functioning. So I actually wanted to show you that because that changes the rhythm of how you would perceive the development of uh, software for the desktop environment. Like everything has changed and almost nothing has changed at the same time because there are a lot of people who are familiar with Docker and the ecosystem and uh, it might appear as if it's just one more thing, but actually it's not, it's completely a game changer. That's why I wanted to talk about it today in this chat. So Docker itself has two products. One is the Docker Hub where they host images and it's a container, container registry, very similar to the ones you have for Google Cloud, Azure, AWS, or any other, um, cloud provider. Um, but the product that I want to particularly focus on now is the Docker for desktop. Uh, in particular, the Docker for desktop for Windows. So the one of the most amazing things that uh, uh, has been with Docker since the beginning is that Docker for desktop has been one of the primary products for uh, Docker irrespective of the rest of the adoption curve or anything else. So this is one product that they have been maintaining it for a long period of time. And I have usually used this to test out containers on my local systems, like on my laptop. But generally what happens is as a developer, you won't be able to test all the container conf configurations or everything that you want to do on your local laptop. You have to switch in to the cloud and you have to use a uh, cloud-based container registry to cloud-based uh, virtual machine or uh, Kubernetes cluster based deploys. So what they have done is actually they have brought Kubernetes to Docker desktop. So they have actually added the capability to run Kubernetes with the same images that are more or less the same images that run um, on GCR uh, or for any other cloud configuration on right on your desktop. This is kind of a big deal because now you can actually interface with uh, your uh, like apps on Kubernetes. If you have if you had services running on Kubernetes, if you have had deployments on Kubernetes in the cloud, the same technologies will help you build uh, desktop apps, which is pretty crazy. Like there is a lot of stuff that you could do, and I'll I'll jump into a couple of the use cases there. So imagine if you were uh, you know using Postman and you just wanted to run an Azure function on your desktop. You know, that sounds that sounds grammatically incorrect when I say that, but actually that's what I mean. Uh, so this is an Azure function that I have set up 
uh, to run on uh, the cloud. So every time I ping this, it's going to respond with your Azure function app is up and running. This is the default Azure function response, but I have kind of customized it with uh, some other parameters and so on. But if you, you can see the preview here, this doesn't sound, this is actually a page that would appear in the web browser, right? So you could actually run this Azure function right on uh, your desktop with what Docker has done today. In fact, you won't even have to use Azure functions. You can use something like kubeless, which is even more crazier because then you can run code that has been built for functions on any cloud on your local desktop. So think about it. You must have, heard, I mean, you, people must have used uh, various toolings, various tools like, you know, uh, Excel macros or many of these like productivity hacks. This is like at the next level because this completely changes and unifies uh, the way desktop apps are built and the way cloud apps are built. So it, it's going to be quite, so there is a kind of a convergence that you can visualize and uh, that usually results in like a new class of companies or a new class of products or a new class of enterprises that hitherto did not exist or were not even contemplatable. So this product is amazing uh, only for this reason right now. So I have not revel, I have never managed to use Docker for desktop for uh, a lot of production development requirements. For that, I usually default to something in the cloud. So I usually default to something in the cloud with Postman, uh, something like this, and I play around with stuff. Uh, Kubernetes also has an API. So if you, you can take the API of Kubernetes and you can uh, in, introspect with what is inside the Kubernetes cluster and then play along with that. So this is the Docker for desktop page. So the cool thing is it shows Docker is already running. So if I do this in my Windows terminal, then it should run. So Let's try to run that and see, just check whether Docker is running, you know. So it, it can't find the image locally. So the, uh, so it's gonna pull from the cloud. It's gonna pull each layer. So each of these layers is effectively blob storage. So each of these layers is something like an S3 bucket, uh, a, fi a blob object inside an S3 bucket. The combination of all of these gives you the final output. So it's it's able to run and it's fetch the uh, getting started latest and uh, uh, image and it's functioning. So you can actually see here that, yeah, so you can actually see here that uh, there's a lot of path variables, environment variables, all of which can be accessible to Postman here. So you can actually make them available to Postman in the environment parameters and you can go from there. The Cool thing is uh, the Kubernetes part though, because this has existed for a while, but, and this is quite cool to test out products, but it's not really, I would say, I usually prefer testing them out on the cloud, like just install it to some virtual machine and then test it out or just, uh, you know, d download it to a small GKE cluster or something or, or AKS Azure Kubernetes service cluster and then like test it out there. But, um, uh, you usually can't do that for uh, developer tools. So you can't do that for, let's say, Visual Studio Code. So for Visual Studio Code, you have to, if you have, if you're using their new dev containers feature, so uh, you will be able to actually test out uh, the entire application that you're building with uh, locally hosted uh, containers. And the containers could, potentially in the future run in the cloud as well. But like right now they are run on your local machine and you can have a very clean and sane, uh, you know, testing environment, especially for a lot of node apps. It's really important because node apps have a lot of dependencies where things change very fast and you need to keep, you need to make sure you're debugging the right issue with node. So, so it's quite useful. The cool thing is that, uh, even Kubernetes is here now. So, that was kind of a shocker for me and enable Kubernetes and you can, 
oh it's going to take a few minutes and requires an internet connection go ahead so it's going to download this but look at the other options it also supports installing deploying with docker stacks um and docker stacks are technically uh something like docker compose i have never used docker stacks i've primarily used docker compose in the past and especially for the use cases where i'm testing out something on my local machine um for example it could be a small open source project with it could be an open source project that has an api and you want to hit that api and test it out uh with different samples uh, requests uh locally before you even commit code to the cloud so it's really useful for that so the cool thing here is the moment i this we have enabled kubernetes then uh, kubernetes is now running let's turn that on as well okay so so kubernetes is running and if you go into the terminal you should be able to actually use kubectl so it's installed kubectl as well so there are no pods but there is one node so it's essentially a machine that runs on uh one node so it's not really a production environment but uh as far as the uh, workability is concerned a lot of your apps currently today also run on only your machine so in that it's kind of similar to that so any app that is existing that is installable onto this kubernetes cluster should technically perform equally well on the cloud as long as you can access it and the interface is the same as what you're using right now so es essentially i think all the telecom providers need to get ready for some kind of netflix style streaming desktops and pcs and phones because uh, it's going to be that's probably going to be the only bottleneck that uh, will that's going to be there so let's look at uh, the namespaces so you can actually see that there's a kubernetes dashboard here that i have installed but uh, i haven't actually set it up uh, for uh, for uh, the uh, the for being a, for the access so let me just come back to that in a, a different video later i'll actually sh probably try out this to install a few apps here and then uh, we'll go from there but you can see that there is a default uh, cl cluster id which is uh, or a namespace i think there's a namespace for which is essentially related to the um, this functioning of the docker hub for desktop itself so they don't there's an option here that pre, that basically tells us that like uh, the system related containers are actually hidden by default so um, so that's mostly it it's actually quite awesome that you can run everything locally and you can deploy onto this with docker compose so i don't know if i have a i, I don't know if i have a I don't know if I I don't think I have access to the uh Docker compose uh, uh configuration right now for one of the projects so I'll just try that out in a different video but this is pretty cool right like so you can actually take you can actually take an an environment variable and you can completely you can add a bunch of variables here create a new environment and you can actually uh manage this environment uh on a per uh, deployment basis so every time you do a kube config deploy you can run a postman collection on your local machine and you can actually change all the environment variables so that you can uh, for example if they contain any secrets like let's say it's your username and uh, password for like logging into uh signing up with the google photos api or something like that so you and you have you are running an app that basically runs google photos locally but is also connected to say other photo apps so it, all of those use cases you can actually in one shot replace your system path variables your environment variables your user level environment variables all of them can be changed in postman with one click by uh, editing creating and managing an environment here so this is a great developer uh, workflow i think uh, it's like a power combination of tools like uh, if you can have apps that run on kubernetes on the desktop 
as well as if you have environments that can be managed through postman so you you kind of have interfacing with the os on different platforms and nothing much would change significantly you know so you can yeah, the set of apps that is compatible with kubernetes and postman and uh, on the desk and the desktop uh, for with postman managing the environment and the path variables is going to be consistent uh, and it's going to be a unique set so it's not going to probably have some of the apps that you use for uh, you know developing electronics of electronics such as national instruments lab view or something like that i'm not sure i don't think they would probably be here right now but uh, i think it's essential that uh, a lot of the other apps are well uh, uh, well constructed to be able to take advantage of all these features because if they don't take advantage of all these features then uh, we're kind of missing out on something right so the cool thing is you could actually even earn money you could actually earn blockchain or bitcoin money by renting out your desktop or your machine for a compute by uh, your neighbors apps so if you could so there are all kinds of unique uh, apps that could be built with this kind of uh, infrastructure so i look forward to that actually because i think there's a lot of compute it's underutilized it's mismanaged or undermanaged it's uh, available for um, a greater uh, unlocking of value so uh, you must have heard of the projects like folding at home and uh, there's a lot of uh, seti at home and so there's a lot of these projects that have always tried to take advantage of um, features and a uh, compute that's been basically purchased and is lying around so this is like really amazing so you have a way of taking those computers and sharing that compute even if it's just for one like you could use one of the machines as an intellisense ser server for visual studio code and you could use the other machine as something like pr as a primary where you actually work on the code so you can do all these kinds of things with this with this uh, unique setup so that's all i wanted to chime in for the week before you get started if you have time check it out uh, i'll put all the links relevant to this video down below in the just before the comments so uh, please go and um, uh, give me your feedback in how you find this feature uh, impacting your work i think this is going to have impact on a lot of product features that are being rolled out today so i would love to hear from you thank you so much have a nice uh, week and uh, i'll jump in probably on tuesday or wednesday again thank you bye